Shalom, I'm covering you. My name is Stephen Benoon. You're watching Dunoon Institute of Biblical Research. An exciting, exciting time uh, that we are living in right now, friends. The soon coming kingdom of Jesus Christ. Uh, and of course, we should right now be ruling and reigning with Him over spiritual wickedness and principalities and high places. Uh, we're, we have command over these demons. And a lot of different messages I'm wanting to bring forth and also uh, going back and re-examining biblical prophecy, especially as our eyes are coming open to re recognize some of these prophecies that have actually been fulfilled. And it, it's an eye opener, it really is. And I, I realize there are some things that, uh, uh, in my personal opinion, I believe that there are some prophecies that are still on the verge of fulfilling even in this day. But I don't think it's going to be quite the way we anticipated it. So please bear with us. And also, I really sincerely ask you forgive us for all the mistakes we've made along the way uh, there. It is humbling to recognize that you have to step back and first say to God, forgive me, Father, for uh, the mistakes we made. We really sincerely believe that we were helping people as we looked at the, the the scripture from the Zionist way of thinking and not that we were uh, programmed by some uh, elite group out there to bring about a Zionist doctrine although we were offered to join into a very Zionist strong Zionist group that felt like that uh, we were going in the direction they would like us to go in uh, and we were really <laughs> We're going to give a great prominence in uh, if we would just espouse the Darby uh, um, Schofield Zionist uh, uh, doctrine to the to the entire world to bring all of our attention to the center focal point of Jerusalem being where God is going to fulfill His word here in the last days, and that uh, you know well I should say we were doing a pretty good job on our own, uh, but uh, nonetheless. As the Father has been dealing with us, our eyes have come open, and we are seeing scriptures just come alive. And so, first, we again apologize to you for the mistakes that we've made, um, and we've made a lot of them. So, but uh, we always, as we've always said, if we make a mistake, we'll say we made a mistake, come make that right, and then let's move forward. Um, these things are not popular, though. A lot of people they're not popular and I realize that we're going to be looking at the story of Joseph and I'm just going to kind of touch the highlights of the story of Joseph because Joseph has been one of the strongest messages I've ever given and, and now I realize why God has never allowed me to finish the book what have rabbis missed because yes Yeshua Jesus is in the story of Joseph uh, and there are cyclical things, cyclical, cyclical events. We know that. We see that. We appreciate that. We will bring those things out as we go there. But there are a lot of problems that we thought were still yet to be fulfilled that were fulfilled. I mean, one of those simple ones, and I'll just, I have it up on my screen anyway. I wasn't going to say it right now. But just going back to Hosea chapter 6, for example. And this is one of the early ones we saw after seeing uh, over in Zechariah chapter 8 about the Jewish man taking a hold of the wing of a Jewish man, uh, uh, the ten men of the nations, and that being Jesus Christ being fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. But then this one was another one right here. Take a look on your screen right here with me. H Hosea chapter 6. After two days he will revive us. On the third day he will raise us up that we may live in his presence. Every single scope filled uh, Bible expositor looks at this we take it a thousand days uh, uh, excuse me a thousand years on earth is but a day with the Lord and those of you that remember when I taught on this I want to bring it out again in case you've not heard that message that as I went back and I was looking at this in the, in the Hebrew now right here you see beyond hashlishi that is three days all right I agree that is three days but right here okay yachayenu Yachayenu is not the word three days. That is our life. Okay? Meyamim, from the days. All right? So it's not after two days he will revive us, but from the days he will revive us 
on the third day. Glory to God. I mean, I get excited now as I go back and look at these amazing prophecies. This was literally a fulfillment, right? Now look at it. Look at verse one. Come, let us return unto the Lord for he hath torn. He will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. All right. He will give us life from the days, from the days of old, on the third day. In other words, he's going to, it's a resurrection message. You remember over, what is it, Matthew? What, let me, let's just pull it up real quick and see. Matthew, I think it's chapter, um, what is it, chapter 28, I believe, something like that. And I don't have that right handy, but I think it's chapter 28 there where it speaks about that there were, uh, let's see, and behold, there was a great earthquake for the angel of the Lord descended from the heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and, and sat upon it, okay? Now, there was a place there, and I'm just trying to remember where that's at. Let me just pull it up over here in, in, in our Bible, this e-sword, this pretty good little search tool there, all right? And uh, we're seen among the living, right the graves were open maybe i should put that like that graves opened right and they came up out of those graves there um let's just go down and find this over here in matthew here we go matthew 27 52 and the graves were open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his after when after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. So now, if we go back to Hosea's prophecy there that we were looking at, see, they would from the days. In other words, those that had died believing on the promise, like Job, for example. Job said, "Though the skin worms destroys this body, yet in my flesh I shall see I, see God." Mine eyes, these eyes, he said, not another shall see him, right? That's written in the book of Job. And so he's talking about from the days, they're going to receive life. And it's going to happen when? On the third day. Christ resurrected on the third day. That's when they raised up as well, as we just saw here in Matthew 27, verse 52 and 53. All right, so it's exciting to see. So see, so many of these things I'm seeing, and I, and I realize now, well, wait a minute, this is not the Darby uh, Schofield. And, and listen, when we say Schofield, you got to do some research on Schofield, friends. Schofield was a, he was a paid man that came in. He was a plant uh, in order to bring about a false narrative for the last days here. All right, so this is what's going on. And, and I'm going to tell you something too. Listen, we are never going to be help our Jewish friends if we do not get the truth of the gospel. You know, I mean, Paul spoke about in Romans about provoking them to jealousy. It's actually in Deuteronomy, right? Deuteronomy chapter 32 says, verse 20, I will hide my face from them and I will see what their end shall be. So God hides his face from Israel because of their idolatry. He says, they have roused me to jealousy with a no God. They have provoked me with their vanities and I will rouse them to jealousy with a no people. I will provoke them with a vile nation. Right? Gentiles. And this is exactly what he does. And, and Paul quotes this in Romans chapter uh, 11. He also speaks about it in chapter 10, I believe it is. Uh, he says here, I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles, insomuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify in my office by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are of my flesh and might save some of them. How is Paul provoking the Jews to jealousy? The fact that he's witnessing to the Gentiles. Because as Gentiles receive Christ as their Savior, it provokes our Jewish friends to jealousy because they're supposed to be receiving the gospel of Jesus Christ. All right, now, many of you, just like myself, now I have actually Genesis 39 up on the screen here to start with, and we're going to be looking at Genesis 39, I believe 40, 41, 42, something like that. Um, some of this I will not have on this screen for you. We're just going to go back and we're going to look at these different, some of these uh, interesting insights here because... In the story of Joseph, 
there are still many of these things that are told in the story of Joseph are cyclical events that happened in the days of Yeshua. But there were also many of them that I actually missed. Uh, and so I wanted to go back and look at these again. Now, and everybody knows, all, even biblical commentators, many of them, they know that Yeshua is a type, Joseph is a type of Yeshua, or Yeshua is a type of Joseph, whichever way you want to look at that. And uh, he was hated of his brethren. He was hated for, uh, of them without a cause. He was spiritual. He saw dreams and visions. And what he saw actually came to pass. All right. Uh, now, I would argue one of them did not fulfill in Joseph, but rather in Jesus. And that's when he saw that the, uh, his mother, his father, and his brethren would bow down before him. All right. Now, Joseph's mother had died and therefore she was never able to bow, but, but his father and his brothers do come. They do bow before him when he is elevated to the right hand of Pharaoh down in Egypt. So the, the remainder of the fulfillment of this is in Christ because the scripture says every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. So yes, that does actually fulfill through Yeshua, through Jesus Christ himself. All right. But there were so many things like this. And of course, his own brothers reject him, uh, even though he is anointed of, of God, they reject him and they end up selling him out uh, to they first they, they conspire to sell him to the Ishmaelites. And as the Midianites come along, they sell him to the Midianites. The Midianites end up selling him to the Ishmaelites and then the Ishmaelites take him down into Egypt and they sell him, excuse me, I'm sorry, it's the other way around. Uh, they saw the, let, let, let's look at the story real quick here and I'll just take you to uh, Genesis chapter 37 here. We'll just go there so you can see this on your screen. Um, but when we get down near the end of this chapter right here, and let's see, one of the first things they do before they sell their brother out when they see him coming, of course, he's always bringing the evil report. And notice that too. He was bringing continually to his father the evil report of how his brothers were doing. Now, mainly from the sons of Zilpah and Hilda, not uh, so much from uh, Leah's sons, but the other two sons, uh, uh, women, uh, Joseph's common wives there, his concubines, he is constantly bearing the bad report to him. And then finally, uh, Jacob sends him down to check on how his brothers were doing. And they go, to, they go down towards Dothan. And when they see him coming, they said, let's take and throw him into a pit and we'll see what comes of his dreams, right? So this is where we pick up in, in Gen Genesis 37. And they sat down to eat bread. And they, oh, wait a minute, let me back up a little bit further. Um, let's see here. And the man said, they are departed hence, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. And Joseph went after his brethren and found them in Dothan. And they saw him afar off, and before he came near unto them, they conspired to slay him. And they said one to another, behold, this dreamer cometh. And come now, therefore, let us slay him and cast him into, a, one, uh, into one of the pits, and we will say an evil beast hath devoured him as we shall see what will become of his dreams and reuben heard it and delivered him out of their hand and said let us not take his life now i find that interesting because reuben his very name means behold a son okay reuben Ru uh, reuben is how you actually pronounce his name reuben and that's interesting because all the time when they would say Reuben's name, it was like saying, behold a son. Now that's, Reuben was given this name because of uh, his mother wanting to get favor with Jacob. And Reuben said unto them, shed no blood, cast him into this pit that is in the wilderness, but lay no hand upon him, he might, uh, that he might deliver him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So Reuben actually had good intentions. Although he did conspire regardless, he still had good intentions. Uh, kind of reminds me of Nicodemus, comes by the way of night. He has good intentions, but he's not willing to let it be known that he actually uh, stands with Joseph. And it came to pass when Joseph was coming to his brethren that they stripped Joseph of his coat, the coat of many colors that was on him. Now in Hebrew, they actually have it as a coat of long sleeves. 
but in the Septuagint, it is a coat of many colors. So I stand more with the Septuagint on that actual translation. And they took him and cast him into a pit, and the pit was empty. There was no water. I thought that was interesting as well. There was no water in that pit. And I believe there was no water because Joseph being a type of Christ, and Christ is the waters of life, right? You remember the story there, and I believe, where is it? Is it over in... Um, uh, here in the book of John, yeah, here we go right here, the story right here. Uh, this is the woman at the well. She comes, Jesus, uh, he meets her there, and he answers, said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. Right there. He would have given thee living water that you don't come here to, to, to draw anymore, right? The woman said to him, Sir, that has nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drink of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said unto him, Sir, Give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here the, to draw. And Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband and come hither. Now we know the story. Uh, she says, I have no husband. He says, you, have, you say the truth. You've had five, and the one you're living with now is not yours, right? Uh, then, wow, then she recognizes, Sir, well, I know that, uh, that when the Messiah cometh, this is what he'll do. All right? So when they, when they threw Joseph in that pit, and it says in there that there was no water, I've always looked at that as a very interesting uh, aspect of the scripture there, because in my opinion, he represented Christ, and therefore Christ was that waters of life. And they sat down to eat bread, and they lifted up their eyes and looked, and behold, a caravan of Ishmaelites came from Gilead, and with their camels bearing spice rain, and and lie down and going to carry it down to Egypt. All right. And Judah said unto his brethren, What profit is if we slay our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him. And he is our brother, our flesh, and his brother hearken unto him. And there passed by Midianite merchants, and they drew him, drew and lifted up Joseph out of the pit and sold Joseph unto the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they brought Joseph on, uh, into Egypt. Now, here's the fascinating things. One, when we look at the scripture where it says they, they, they took his garment, his coat of many colors off of him. You know, there's several different things that I see in that passage in itself there. One, it's just like the, the, the Jewish people of 2,000 years ago, Christ's own brethren. One, we know they stripped him of his garment there. They gambled over his garment. And some people say it was the Roman soldiers. According to the Hebrew Matthew, it was the Pharisees. Oh my goodness. And let me tell you something. For some reason, Adamo.org is no longer allowed, they, or they don't have the, the Hebrew Gordon's, uh, Gor, excuse me, um, Hebrew Matthew, George Howard's, Hebrew Matthew up any longer, so I'd have to photograph it. I didn't have time to put it in there this time here, but it's actually the Pharisees. The Pharisees were those soldiers. They were actually soldiers that were hired by uh, the Pharisees. Not saying they weren't Gentiles now, but that's exactly what it was, and they gambled for his garment. But you could also say that when they killed him, when they took Christ's life, see, they had no power over him but once they took it once his once he died on the christ now christ doesn't he, you can't take his life he had to dismiss his life i get that there but in prefigure there the fact that they stripped him of his rope hung him on a cross and then pierced his side right pierced his side and the blood and the water came out, which, by the way, also shows to the woman at the well that he was that water of life because from him, his water was separated from his blood coming out. Amazing, amazing insights we find in the scripture. But at any rate there, his garment, his body was a garment in itself, right? So there we have that. But what else did they do? They sold him out to the Gentiles. And of course, Jesus' own kindred sold him out 
to the Roman authority to have him put to death. Because they said they couldn't do it according to their own law. And oddly enough, if you look at Acts chapter, and I'll pull that up for you. I think it's important that we have this up on the screen so we can see this. Acts chapter 2, okay? Acts chapter 2. And specifically, verse 36, I believe, is what we need to have here. You will see there, Therefore let all the house of Israel, the house of Israel, uh, know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So it wasn't just the house of Judah that put Yeshua to death, but also according to Peter, who wrote, or Paul writes the book of Acts, but uh, we find out that according to what Paul wrote here, that the house of Israel is also found guilty for the blood of Jesus Christ. So therefore, his all 12 tribes are now being held responsible, like the 11 brothers that Joseph had that were being held responsible all those years ago. But as I say, it's stated though, they all sold him out. They sold him out to the Gentiles, right? And now the Gentiles, as we see the scripture in Romans, they were provoked, you know, Israel is provoked to jealousy because the gospel turns to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, you know, they receive the gospel. Now you got to keep in mind, it's still, even back 2,000 years ago, the churches, we would call it then, or the Christians, those that were Christ-like, were predominantly Jewish. Okay? In fact, uh, so many passages, so many scriptures, including like the case of Zechariah 8.23, uh, the ten men of the nations will take a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew and say, uh, we will go with you, for we hear God is with you. That Jew is that Jewish man. The 130 the, from the house of Judah, those apostles that were in the upper room, they were the ones that took a hold of his sleeve. All right. You know, I had somebody at the, at, at the meeting here in Orlando made the comment to me. They said, you know, Brother Steve, Jesus could not have been wearing a tzitzit. It's just a conjecture on their part, but I thought it was interesting when they said this because I had never heard that before. They said he couldn't have been wearing a tzitzit because, you know, the tzitzit was given to the children of Israel so that they would grab it and remember to keep the commandments of God. Jesus didn't have to do that because he was the word of Almighty God. And I'm like, wow, that is provocative. So I thought that was interesting. But anyway... Regardless which way you want to look at that, I'm not here trying to sit there and make a doctrine out of that. I just I thought it was very fascinating myself. But nonetheless, uh, going back into this, they sell him out. But what's interesting is when the Egyptians go down into Egypt, excuse me, not the Egyptians, but when the Ishmaelites and the Midianites, Midianites sell him to the Ishmaelites, and then the Ishmaelites take him and they sell him to Pontifer, who is a priest in Egypt, represents the preachers. Of today right and as I was saying though the the early church as we can go back and look at the book of Acts on this those early believers when when of course their hearts were pricked in their heart and said uh, unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles men and brethren what shall we do all right and then Peter said unto them repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many words did the testify and exhort, say, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. This was, this was a... Israelite revival happening in the country of Israel 2,000 years ago. All 12 tribes. And you got to remember the scripture says, and Paul quotes this over in Romans. Watch this. Paul actually says, speaks about it, right? When he's saying this, and I forget exactly where that's at, but he talks about uh, those, oh no, that's actually Romans chapter 10, I believe it is. Uh, the, you know, speaking about that they would be, let's see, let me just pull it up in my Bible here. I'll just have, you'll just have to kind of follow along with me on this. But uh, let's see here. Maybe it is in Romans 11. 
right? Because uh, he says in there, let's see. Mm. Or maybe it is in chapter 10 or chapter, oh, I think it's actually cha yeah, chapter 9, verse 27. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Now that's actually in the book of Romans. Okay, now Romans, uh, interestingly enough, now, now Paul writes, a remnant shall be saved. If you look at this, though, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 10, where they say it comes from, it says here, verse 21, a remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto God the mighty. That's interesting. El Gibor. Remember also, I think it's in Isaiah 9, where it talks about uh, a son is born, is, he's, he, he shall be called Counselor, Prince of Peace. What? The mighty God, which is what? In Hebrew, El Gibor. For though thy people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them shall return, and the extermination is determined, overflowing with righteousness. That last part of that verse is talking about 70 A.D. when destruction, that great tribulation of their day, would come upon them. Okay, but only a remnant shall return. Now, now Paul uses the word saved, and the reason why he says saved, because when you are saved, you are brought back to the place where you had left God. And that's what it actually took right there. In order to save them, they had to return. And that is, that is when all, both Judah and the house of Israel, both houses returned, and they returned back to Israel uh, back during uh, the days of Acts chapter 2. This is when it was on the day of Pentecost, uh, 50 days after uh, the crucifixion of our Lord. And of course, like I said, the entire church was a Jewish church. We had some Gentiles, but predominantly, and nearly for almost 200 years, it was all Jewish. So when they talk about, oh, you Gentiles, you are looking at replacement theology. You're just trying to replace the Jews. This is totally false, friends. All right? The church was all Jewish in the beginning. How can the Gentiles replace uh, the, 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 how, can, how can we replace the Jewish people? They were the ones that brought the gospel of Jesus Christ to us, to the Gentiles. This is not a replacement theology. All right? But getting back to the story of Joseph, that's what I want to focus on right here, the story of Joseph. The story of Joseph is absolutely uh, just provocative because, as I said, his own brethren sell him out. They, they basically just give him up for 20 pieces of silver to the Gentiles. Of course, and, and it is Judas Iscariot for you know 30 pieces of silver. He does the same thing. He gives up Jesus to be condemned by his own people and then to be handed over to the Gentiles for the crucifixion. Now, then uh, as a hand him over down in Egypt, he's handed over to Pontifer. Pontifer is a minister, a type of the church pastors today. Now, Pontifer, in the beginning, does a nice job. He appreciates uh, Joseph. He knows that uh, because of Joseph, everything in his household is blessed. Everything. All because of Joseph. And so he elevates Joseph to become like the head man in his uh, household there, you know, gives him great honor because he knows that he is blessed as a result of Joseph. But the strange thing is, though, is Potiphar's wife cast her eye upon Joseph. And she doesn't cast her eye upon Joseph for anything good, but rather to commit adultery and to pervert the word of God is exactly the way that story would be taken. Now look here, Genesis 39. And Joseph was brought down to Egypt, and Pontifer, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought, bought him 
uh, of the hand of the Ishmaelites and had brought him down uh, thither. And the Lord was with Joseph and he was prosperous man and he was in the house of the master of Egypt. And his master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found favor in his sight and, it, and he ministered unto him. Notice that. Christ, in this case, Joseph is a type of Christ, ministers unto Potiphar. And he appointed him over, uh, over his house and all that he had, and he put it into his hand. And it came to pass through time that he, appointed, he had appointed him over overseer in his house and over all that he had, and that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for, the, for Joseph's sake. Right? But then the time comes where Pontifer's wife decides that she is more interested in him and having a child with him, which would be adultery. And so through a spiritual adultery, because see, Jesus said, if a man looks upon a woman to lust after, he's committed adultery with her already. So see, in her case there, and it's the other way around, the woman has got the lust after Joseph, and so therefore she was committing adultery spiritually with him. She wanted to lie with him. She wanted to, to, to basically pervert who Joseph was. And this is exactly what happened within the church itself. During that whole time that Joseph was away from his own people, now the Gentiles have their opportunity. Uh, and instead of lifting Joseph up and recognizing the true gift in him, they do for a little while, but he's still a prisoner, which I kind of find that interesting, still a prisoner in the house of Pontifer. And then his wife comes along and perverts everything. And then when she can't have her way, when she finds out that she can't pervert, in this case, Joseph representing Christ, the word of God, and he has to flee from her, she also strips him of his garment. Just like the church has done today. Strip him of his garment and then on top of it, take and tell lies to the ministers about Joseph. And all the servants in his house believe the lies. See, we forget that the story of Joseph has more types and shadows than just that of Israel and just that of Joseph making himself known unto his brethren. We have a lot of those types in there that turns the tables around on those believers. All right? Very serious, very serious situation indeed. And it's something that many of us are not even thinking about just how serious that really was okay now as we continue on in this uh i want to share with you more of what we have here okay so she does this she bears that false witness on him and then of course joseph ends up in the prison and now joseph and here's what's interesting. If we look at it as a type, I remember many times before I spoke about because when, when uh, the, the butler and the baker are put in the prison as well, and once they're down there in the prison with Joseph, of course, uh, Joseph has the dreams he sees, he prophesies, tells him what's going to happen to them. The uh, butler is restored to his position. The baker is hung. And uh, like we can use the types there as well as with Christ, there was two thieves on either side uh, with him. And one, Jesus says, you'll be with me today in paradise. We can look at that as a type. But we can also look at the fact that if we take the two uh, two years that he spends down in the prison while the, while the, from the, from the, notice this, the butler is lifted back to his position and he is living off the fact that Joseph prophesied that, but totally forgets Joseph, leaves him down in the prison. Could have helped bring him out, but he leaves him down. Now, if we take that as an example of 2,000 years, the two years that he was there for 2,000 years, then we could say as well that the Gentile church for the last 2,000 years has left Christ imprisoned. Didn't bother to bring him out. See, this is our time. This is what we've had. All the types and shadows. If we're going to type and shadow Israel, we've got to type and shadow the Gentile church as well because the Gentile church, one, tried to pervert the word of God, and when they couldn't pervert it, they stripped him of his clothes and had him in prison so nobody would know the truth of the matter. 
find that interesting, don't you? Now, so Joseph is in prison. The butler is restored to his position. And when famine is about to strike the land, oh, then he remembers, oh, uh, I apologize, forgive me. I remember there was a man down in the prison who all the things and everything. And of course, uh, the Pharaoh brings up Joseph. They wash him up and everything. And now Joseph becomes the prince of Egypt, so to speak. He becomes the prince of the land. All right. Now, looking at the shadows and types, this is what's important, though. As we look at those shadows and types, let's go over to uh, Genesis 42. And as one of them opened, it said, okay, there are many things that we know. And this is one of the most important things, I think, that we've got to pay attention to. When we get to Genesis chapter 42, now there's a famine in the land. Just as the scripture says, there's going to be a famine, not for, not for uh, bread and water, but for hearing the word of God. Now they're all under a famine. Okay? Both Jew and Gentile alike are suffering as a famine. The Jew suffers, our, our, our fellow friends in Israel are suffering, and all the Jewish people around the world are suffering because they sold out their Messiah. The church is suffering from the same famine because they put him in prison. So they're all suffering. Now Christ has been raised to the right hand of God and there is a door open that we can have access to Christ, to Joseph. But there's an approach that has to be made. Now of course his brethren come down. You know. And, and if you'll notice, though, first, before his brother come down, did you notice, though, that all the nations around Egypt, they would come down to, to get corn themselves because they had already sold him out. They didn't have anything, so they had to give everything they up, everything they had. They gave up everything so that they could live. Notice Jesus said, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He quotes the Old Testament when he says that to Satan, right? And the Gentiles... They were coming in that when the famine was going on, they did come back. They found the church finally comes back to Joseph after he's been lifted up out of the prison. But this time it'll cost them everything they have. They're going to have to not just give up their money. They will give up their lands. They're going to give up everything so that they can live. Joseph's brothers come down as well. Now that's the part that I totally missed a long time ago when I taught these stories on, the, on, on these parables on Joseph. Because we would say, well, you know, look, while the Gentiles are receiving the gospel, then the, then the Jews, they will come in at the very end and then their eyes will be made open. But did you notice it's not in Israel? Did we ever think for a moment, though, that not one time does Joseph go to Israel to reveal himself to his brethren? They had to come to Egypt. And they didn't get the revelation from the pastor that put him in prison, from the false accusation of the church. But they come to their brother. And the first thing he does is accuse them of being a bunch of spies. Isn't that interesting? To spy out the land. And that's kind of interesting in itself because this is exactly what we find out today. That there has been organization of, uh, in Judaism that has sent spies in amongst the Gentile church. Hmm. So Joseph's ten brothers went down to buy corn from Egypt. The famine was in the land of Canaan. So they talk about that the word of God is to come out of Israel. It did 2,000 years ago. But the time that Joseph is going to reveal himself to his brethren, there is a famine in Canaan, and that famine doesn't end either. And we look for the types and shadows, and you find out that the famine is still going on in, 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 in Jerusalem. And yet everybody's trying to flock around Jerusalem. Oh, there's going to be a great thing. Uh, the Messiah is going to return. And they're all about building a third temple. An Antichrist temple they're building. Do you realize that building the third temple is blasphemed to Jesus Christ? I would never buy one single coin to support that third temple. 
That's, that's almost equivalent to spitting in his face. When you know that he is the temple of Almighty God and you as members of his body And listen, I don't follow. If you did it, God knows. Listen, I've made enough mistakes as it is. I'm not here to accuse you, my brothers or my sisters. I would just repent. You know, I don't say get rid of it. I don't know what to tell you. You know, I'm sure that these things have some kind of value or whatever. You know, it can be melted down or something later. But I, listen, I, do you know, and, and also it was, um, oh gosh, I forget the brother's name. Two different ones there. Uh, that did a video exposing the Temple Institute. They've had enough money in the Temple Institute to pay off the Temple, uh, the temple over seven times already and still begging for money. Mm. But like I said, J Joseph does reveal himself to his brethren. But it's not in Israel. He actually fulfilled this prophecy on the day of Pentecost. This is when he fulfilled revealing himself to his brethren. Now, it continually is done. Because as I said to you over in the book of Acts, we find in verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay? We see that Hosea, it wasn't after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up. Nope. He will give life, basically, to us from the days, from the days gone by. And when does he do it? On the third day after his resurrection, Scripture was fulfilled. That's exactly what happened according to Matthew 27, 51 and 52. Right? Isn't it interesting, all these Scriptures being fulfilled? Hmm. And here he is. Here's the bread of life right here. And when he had taken five loaves, see, two fishes, he looked up to heaven, blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples, set them before them, and the two fishes divided he among them all. And they did eat and were filled. And they took up 12 baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. And they did eat of the loaves and were about 5,000 men. See, he could still multiply the food, just like Joseph did with that down in those granaries down there. But Jesus could do it without even having to store it up in the granary. See why? He is the manna. He is the son of the living God. He is God manifested in the flesh. But whosoever drinketh of the water, we already read that. I'm sorry, I apologize for going back to that right there. But you see, then in Genesis 45, I'll kind of quickly finish this because I've got to go into another broadcast there. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by him. And he cried and caused every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians heard, and the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I am Joseph, doth my father yet live? And his brethren could not answer him, for they were affrighted at his presence. And Joseph said unto his brethren, Come near to me, I pray you. And they came near and said, I am Joseph, your brethren, whom you sold into Egypt. And now be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me hither, for God to send me before you to preserve life. You see, the Jewish people back 2,000 years ago, don't be angry with them. They had to do that in order to preserve life. Not just the life of the Jewish people, but also for the Gentiles as well. And all the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It was to open that door. And this is why, for just a short time, there are... the Pharisees as Jesus said to them because you say you see he said had you been blind your sin you, you would not have sin but because you say you see your sin remaineth he also told him except that you believe that I am you will die in your sins see there is there is this really strange group out there and I kind of, I really believe they're stealing the identity of, of Judaism. They're stealing the identity of the Jewish people. Because the Jewish people, 
is God begins to stir their hearts. They believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Listen to me, friends. If you've ever in your life, don't wait any longer. If you've got Jewish friends, with all the love you can, witness to them the beautiful gospel of Jesus Christ. This is the hour. This is the time. I've been guilty for many, many years of thinking we shouldn't say anything right now. Just let them alone. God will open their eyes when the time comes. That time is already now. We've long let that time spent. Now, there's been many a Christian that knew better. And also, too, like I said to, to, to you, my, my, my Christian brothers and sisters that are Gentiles, we also have some repenting to do because we held him bound. Like Pontifer, we allowed him to be thrown into prison under false accusations. Pontifer's wife represents the church. See? Under a false accusation, allowed him to be bound in a prison. It's time we elevate him to the rightful place that he belongs. It's time that we as the butler remember our era and elevate him to the rightful place he belongs. Because only then as we elevate Christ to the place that he belongs can the Jewish people recognize their Messiah. As long as you keep him bound in lies even they can't see. I'm Stephen Benoon with the Noon Institute of Biblical Research. God bless you and thank you for watching.